Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second Saturday seminar. Uh, this one is about traditional sale design and construction. And the idea with this is that we would parallel things that are happening on the ship, even if you can't be here in person, uh, these are things that are happening on board um, or in the organization. So when the ship is laid up in the winter, it's a good time to work on your sails. So we're gonna take a look at them. So I'm here on one of our jibs. Um, they are stored as open as possible in the winter. You don't want to cram them into small packages because the hard folds aren't good for the canvas. Um, and I've opened this one up so we can take a look at a few things. So I'll try and bring things closer you can see, but it's sewn together in long strips of canvas. So here up close, you can see, can you see? There's a little bit of backlight. Um, one of the seams, this is in between two long panels and then here's the next one. There's another seam. So you can see this is one panel um, and that comes in a roll in a bolt of canvas. Uh, they used to come very long and you'd have to reinforce them but nowadays fortunately they make them a convenient size to work with directly. So it's, uh, the strips are all sewn together and then there are some details added on the edge for strength and particular purposes. So we'll talk about those different things. Um, I'm saying canvas because now we say canvas to mean the sailcloth in general. Um, it used to mean hemp, which was a material used uh, in the past. But the word actually probably comes from Sanskrit, which is very cool, quite old. Uh, Kana was, was hemp. Uh, but canvas for us now just means the sail clock. So the first step in the process, you'll have the rig plan so you know what the overall dimensions of the sail should be, what the shape is of the space that you're filling with the sail is, and then you're gonna set out to do your first layout. So the first layout uh, is not done on the ship. You find somewhere ashore to do that, maybe a school gym, uh, maybe a parking lot that you have to sweep for a while beforehand, uh, for example. And then you take your canvas and your sail plan. And what you do is you draw um, the shape of the sail that you're going for. And then here's your, your bolt of canvas. You just roll out all the strips, leaving plenty of extra on the edges. And then you're gonna mark them all so that you can sew them together. You're not gonna stay in the parking lot sewing all these. So you just, Cut them in strips so that they will cover the shape of the sail and then mark them, you know, which one's which, starting wherever you like. And you're gonna add little strike up marks. So when you sew the sail, you'll see these later. Um, you know, you're doing it evenly. So the first layout is to prepare you for seaming the sail. Before we go too far, I'll mention what we are sewing. So I did say uh, earlier sails, like Egyptian sails were, were linen. Um, sails were hemp for a long time and then flax. Um, and then they were cotton. And the reason they went to cotton instead of flax was a few. <laughs> One is that flax, like other traditional materials that are natural fiber, they absorb water when they're wet and shrink. And when they dry out, they get really loose and saggy. Um, flax does that a lot worse than cotton and cotton can be woven a lot tighter. So, the nerd burst of the day, cotton fibers, although short, a long cotton fiber would be about two inches long. They can be woven together really nicely, and here's how this works. If we look at it under the microscope, here's the microscope. Um, unripe cotton is, cotton is uh, sort of flabby there, this is the cross section. Uh, half ripe starting to open up, and then notice there's a little twist in it, and ripe cotton, has a nice round cross section and it twists in this beautiful double helix, which means that you can twist the fibers together and they hold really well. So this was a preferable material to flax for, for that reason. Um, of course, today we're using synthetics. This is Oceanus, it's designed to look like traditional material. Uh, so it has a similar feel, similar, similar look, uh, but it's not susceptible to rot. It does not absorb water. Um, it is weakened by the sun, UV damage, um, but it is it is 
preferable. It's more convenient than, than cotton canvas for most ships today. So if we have done our first layout, we've marked all the pieces and we go ashore and we're gonna sew them all together. Then we've got to set up to do our seaming. So, get a different sail for this demonstration. We'll do this from uh, your perspectives. So it will look like my hands will be yours and that's what you'll you'll be seeing. So let's say we're going to seam uh, these two pieces together. Obviously this sail has already been made um, and it was machine seamed. So the zigzag stitches are from the sewing machine and the dark blue lines um, are designed to be the sew two lines. Um, it's an orientation marker. Uh, nowadays, they don't make it quite so dark and obvious, but it should still still be there. And if you look closely, or I hold it still, there are strike-up marks. So it's a little pencil line that goes in between the two pieces of canvas. And they come every so often. You don't need to measure these when you mark them. Here's another one. In between the two pieces of canvas, it just is to make sure that as you sew along, you're sewing evenly 10 centimeters of this cloth to 10 centimeters of this cloth. Uh, that's not where we do the shaping is, is by uh, uneven seaming. So you're gonna hold this still. You want something to pull against. And for that, we'll use a bench hook. Um, and this one here is was a fish hook. Uh, it's just dull and blunt now. So that it's, it doesn't need to stick into the canvas. What you're gonna do is just put it in between the stitching that is still strong. So let's say I'm repairing this stitching, for example. I'm just gonna slip it in between uh, the other stitches and that's gonna provide something I can pull against, pull back on. So then I'll want my thread and I always wanna sew with a fathom of thread or less, depending on what I'm doing, um, because it otherwise just blows around too much and gets stuck on things. And it's actually more efficient, faster uh, to sew with one fathom and change your thread a little more often than it is to try to sew with a really long thread. So you might notice I did pull out two fathoms. And the reason is that in traditional sail making, you're almost always gonna sew with at least doubled thread. So the thread is middled hanging on the needle there. And it's pre-waxed, but we're gonna wax it again. Uh, so I usually split the two sides of the thread with my finger so that they don't twist together as you're doing this. You want everything to be smooth. Also notice that I didn't pull the thread straight up off the top of the spool. I let it spin and unwind. And again, that's because I don't want it to be all twisty when you're sewing. It gets annoying later on. So you can uh, mix tar into the wax. Ideally, it's kind of nice and dark and sticky. This is just straight up beeswax, which is okay. I definitely want to wax the part where the needle is going to be. That's where it's most likely to break. And another reason why you don't want to sew with more than a fathom, because you just wear out that part of the thread. So, my palm is locked away. Um, I'll use a palm. Um, which is just a hard part in your hands so you can actually push through the layers of canvas. And the way you do this, um, you hold the needle so your thumb and your pointer finger are steering. And then your uh, middle finger is just checking that the back of the needle is actually in the stone, in the metal there, in the right spot. Ooh, do this in reverse so you can see. You definitely don't want it to be pushing back into your hand. Uh, that's that's a nasty injury. So third finger is just just checking that it's in the right spot there when you sew. So when we get started, um, and again, this is sort of a confusing example because there already is a seam here. Let's say I'm repairing it. Um, there are very few knots in sail making. So I don't need a knot for this one either. Um, I'm just gonna come up 
Notice I'm starting in the existing stitching, so I'm, I'm repairing this. And I should be using as small a needle as possible. Mm, I'm gonna, sorry, for, for the sake of this example, I'm gonna start here. Um, a small needle as possible so that you don't damage the canvas. And again, I don't need a knot. We're just gonna tuck the tails over here and I'm gonna sew over them. So in my next stitch, I'll leave this where you can see. In my next stitch, I'm just gonna go over these and capture them. And I have an interesting conundrum here. This is sort of like uh, sewing something to your pants on accident. Because the sail is big and it's folded over so that I can have the seam in this orientation, I want to make sure not to sew the sail in half to itself. So the way that you do that is that every stitch you're going to actually poke the needle into the back piece of canvas. So every single time, see I have this folded, I'm going to poke the needle all the way through the top canvas and prick the back and then you can hear it. I don't know if you can, but uh, hear it give a little kind of tick when it lets go. So then I know that I have dropped the back piece of canvas. And you do that every single time to make sure uh, that you're not sewing it to itself. So I'm trying to leave these where you can see, but I'm sewing over the little tails until they run out. So we don't need a knot and it's nice and flat. There's nothing to chafe away. I'll try and do a quiet one and see if you can hear the, the tick of the back cloth. I don't know if you can hear that. So something else I'm doing, as I'm sewing, the thread is kind of spiraling. Um, and I don't want it to become all twisted. So every time, to counter that, you roll the needle in your hand just a tiny bit to undo the twist. And you end up in a rhythm with your motions. I can tell where to put the needle because of where it starts to curve poke into both sides of the canvas. This canvas is very old and falling apart. Uh, and then up through the next one. And when I pull out the needle, I just give it the slightest roll with my thumb. And I get into a motion where my right hand goes one way and then my left hand pulls the rest of the slack. I'm right-handed, so I'm sewing from right to left. If you're left-handed, you'll sew from left to right. So each seam is done by people of the same handedness. Um, and you carry on. So we want seven to 10 stitches for the length of the needle. So what do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight. Um, so that's about the size and shape. In new canvas, uh, you can make nice, pretty small stitches, but in old canvas, if you're repairing something, your stitches are gonna be pretty large uh, so that you're not likely to make a perforated tear on the dotted line section. Okay, are there any questions? I don't see any. All right, we well, have a moment to think of something while I shuffle. So that was the first layout and then the seaming. So let's say we've, uh, Seam this whole sail <laughs> while I shuffle it. Okay, and what happens next is the second layout. So by now we should be in uh, another port. Maybe we're in reunion and we take ashore our swath of canvas. So before we had strips that were marked and we sewed them together and now we have a big area 
of potential sale. And we take that ashore. Uh, the green strips are the orientation of the cloth. And we're going to draw our sail on it. So we'll take a moment to point out the orientation. So we're doing a jib. That's fun. Uh, lots of jibs are cut with a miter, meaning this uh, V seam here. And the reason for that, it's the least distortable for this sort of shape. Uh, it stands up um, to the forces applied on it the best. So one thing to notice with the cloth is that it's strongest in the lengthwise direction. This is traditional sail making. So the warp threads, the long ones, are the strongest direction. So you want to make sure as you're designing the sail, you're taking advantage of the strong length of the cloth and minimizing the amount of angle you have on the bias. So the bias is the diagonal of the sail. So everybody try something really quick with your t-shirt. Try pulling your t-shirt up and down. Wait, you, you're not trying it. Everybody try it. Okay. So uh, pull your t-shirt up and down. That's the, the strong direction. It stretches some. And pull your t-shirt sideways. It definitely stretches more. And then if you pull it on the diagonal, it'll really go. So the diagonal is the bias. And we want to make sure when we design a sail, we have minimal bias along um, directions of tension. So when you miter the sail this way, this is a bias direction. It's a little bit of a diagonal, but it's not too steep. Um, it is on the left where the most tension up and down is, but uh, we'll reinforce the sail for that. So when we add our sail shape, this is the, the fun part and where the skill and experience of the sail maker comes in. Uh, we need to make an airfoil. So a jib actually gets a lot of its shape just in the way that it's set. Uh, but we will assist it and I'll draw ex um, exaggerated shapes here so you can see. Oh, we've got a reflection. So if we're making an airfoil, roughly a third of the way back from the leading edge from the luff is where we'll have the max curve. So about a third of the way in, you can't see that. There was less light earlier. Okay, so about a third of the way in is where we want the max curve. So again, I'm, I'm exaggerating. And then we'll smooth out the curve from there all along the foot of the sail. So how much this mat, max curve should be is determined by um, the sail maker. If you have a binder of your sails on board, there might be hints about how much that should be. Um, or the sail maker want, might want to try something based on how the last one worked out. So here's the max curve. And the way that you smooth this out, usually you take a, a skinny light line, like a heaving line ashore, and you just pull it. You mark this max distance and then pull it smooth so it makes a nice, beautiful curve. You see... Not a question, comment, okay. Um, so that's the foot and then for the luff, we need the shape of the sail to be able to stand up to the pull of the sheet. So the sheet is pulling here, right? Um, at this angle. So we need to make sure that we don't just collapse and fold the sail when we try to sheet it in. So the max curve um, for this sail will be opposite the sheet. And again, I'm drawing this way too big, but let's say it's out there. And same thing with the heaving line. You're going to make a nice smooth curve. It's not to scale. <laughs> not to scale. Um, with the max right opposite the sheet. So does anyone notice something interesting about the curve here on the luff as opposed to the one on the foot? Don't be shy. If anyone is thinking, well, gee, this curve goes all the way along the foot and this extra curve goes most of the way up, but doesn't, that's odd. So an interesting thing about head sails, um, like all sails, um, but more so with the head sails, it's obvious that 
the space you're filling with a sail isn't static, it changes. So when you're sailing, this is on a wire cable, right? And when you push with lots of wind into the sail, it pushes the cable off to the side. And so the triangle isn't a rigid shape to fill. The stay bends, it sags off to leeward. And the sail maker should account for that. So that's part of why this forward roach. Um, roach today we use to mean an outward curve in the shape. That uh, used to just mean cut with a curve. Now we say roach is an outward curve and a hollow is the inward negative curve. So the sailmaker will plan for that by having the roach stop um, near the head and maybe become a hollow. So if you have a steel ship with a really stiff rig, it's very rigid, there shouldn't be as much stag in, sag in the stays. Uh, but if you have a, a wooden ship with a soft, sloppy rig, there's going to be a lot more and that should be accounted for in the sails. Okay, now I might see a question. Doesn't go the whole distance along the edge, yes. Okay, um, and then the, the leech might have a little roach, probably not too much. Um, modern sailmakers may do something called broad seaming. Um, in traditional sailmaking, you don't do this much because it's sort of simpler and easier to do on large scales when you don't. But broad seaming is when, let's say, here are two um, two different strips of canvas and the way that they normally overlap to be sewn together is even. Um, but you can alter that. So it's possible to sew them instead of straight and even together so that one starts to overlap the other one more or maybe overlap the other one less. So broad seaming is when you take up using the canvas or release so it's, uh, it's common for modern sailmakers to do broad seaming in the leeches, especially to, to make sure that you don't have a hard cupped edge to catch wind. That's not, not what you're after. You want the, the wind to flow smoothly off the end. So you often have a bit of a broad seam on the leech that kind of releases it. So your overlapping tapers might get a little wider there. Well, that's just more a point of interest in traditional sail making. Again, you tend to sew all these miles of seam just straight and the shape comes from this part. Um, since we're doing our second layout here, we need enough canvas to add the tabling, et cetera, on the edge. So the tabling again is the hem of the sail essentially. The corner pack. <laughs> so here we go. Um, here's one strip of canvas coming in, and then the tabling is, is this extra bit of hem that used to be here in the layout. It's cut off and then just laid up here. Although, notice something about this. Here's the seam coming in, but then here's the seam in the tabling. So that you don't stack them right on top of each other just out of practicality, it's just too many layers of canvas in one spot. And it's okay to offset it just a little bit because the shape, um, it's, it's a, such a small change that's okay. So the way we're getting the tabling is we'll just add some or a border essentially around the sail, the whole sail. So now, now that we have the sail shape, we'll go around and draw. Uh, the tabling on straightly or with a fair curve. So you, this one you would measure. You do the shape with your heaving lines. Ooh. Uh, but you would just measure out from the shaped curves to have, uh, say, so many centimeters of tabling go around the entire thing. And this essentially is what you're going to cut out. You'll add a little bit of extra because you want to fold the edges. You don't, you don't want raw cut edges in your sail, but you leave enough you can fold over. And this is what you're going to cut out. So we've drawn the shape, um, which is again the red outline, not the black one. And then we draw add some for tabling. 
and then you're gonna cut it out. It's starting to be a sale now. Um, at this stage, you're, you'll also cut the corner patches. So the reinforcing uh, pieces of canvas you'll cut out of something else um, so that you can add them on the corners for reinforcement. So you'll notice, if you're watching this, you probably know this from observation. At the corner of the sail, has extra pieces of canvas in it. So it's not just the kind of the body of the sail with the tabling. There's some reinforcement, some extra pieces where there's gonna be more tension. So you can see them probably better back here. The so one's going off down here, one's going off down there. So those come with a second layout. You design those, cut them out, draw them on. So I have to quick oh, check for questions. Uh, would you do broad seaming using some materials more than others? Yeah, I would say so. So with it's kind of more that the process of traditional sail making is, is usually not going to involve broad seaming. And that process is when, or more likely to be used with, for example, cotton, cotton canvas um, or or oceanus, but I would say, yes, traditional sail making, you're probably using not certain synthetics like Dacron, because that's hard to work with by hand. So something more modern like Dacron. All the modern sails really are a polyester and they have different amounts of resin um, smashed into them, <laughs> really. So more resin is a harder sail, um, less porous, which is Stiffer and doesn't let the wind through and has some other advantages. However, it's hard to work with by hand. So it's not something you're gonna wanna do a lot of hand work on in, if possible. So in those kinds of materials, yeah, you would do more broad seaming and also, you know, like the modern racing sails are using Kevlar and all kinds of um, snazzy stuff. That's broad, the whole thing is all, it's all <laughs> computer design, broad seams going all sorts of directions and, and different weaves. So that's kind of a, a different ball game. Okay, yeah, it's a little hard to see. Yes, <laughs> try and hold a different direction. Okay, so I wanna take a minute and do one of my one of my favorite parts. So, so far we've talked about how we cut out the shape. We've taken strips of canvas and made them into a large swath of material and then we've drawn a sail on it uh, with the shape and enough extra material for the corners, etc. But we still haven't really made it a sail. So here's the best part. Um, what we have right now, it's a two-dimensional triangle. It happens to have a curvy foot. And I'm drawing something more like a mainsole because it's a little easier, I think, to, to follow along this way. So the mainsole, in this case, has a nice exaggerated <laughs> curved foot, but this is still flat canvas with a funny shape. It's not really a sail. So the way we make it a sail is when we take this foot and we pull along the length of the foot, when we pull to straighten this out, something happens. So as you pull in opposite directions here, the curvy line becomes straight. And then the extra canvas that was down here has to go somewhere so it goes to the side into the sail, and now you have an airfoil. So this is really how the shape of the sail is created. I'll do one more explanation because this is really uh, <laughs> important through how this changes. So. Again, here you have all these, th these are kind of showing that the sail is flat, these lines, and the shape is outlined is a curve at the bottom. And you, when you pull the bottom curve, it goes to straighten out. 
and the extra canvas that was here has to go somewhere. So it moves to the side. We'll draw that one more way. That's what I usually do on, on the boat. Okay, so if I have the curvy bottom of a sail and then I pull on it this way so that it goes straight, the line goes straight, but to make the line straight, the sail had to be curved. So I hope that makes sense so you can see it. Uh, it's my favorite part. Uh, I think <laughs> it's pretty cool. And that's how you, how you get the shape to be three-dimensional. So now if you try to lay the sail down, uh, it wouldn't go flat. It is actually now a three-dimensional thing, a floppy thing, but it still has a shape. Okay, um, so the next phase is all the handwork. So it feels like the sale is pretty done at this point. Um, and then you'll find yourself weeks later still working on it. So uh, the last phase involves the roping and the corners and cringles, etc. So the roping, the bolt rope, uh, is the border of the sail. It goes around the whole thing. If you look at it closely, if I can find an orientation for you to see, notice that the sail looks kind of wrinkly next to the bolt rope, and that's on purpose. So as you're sewing, um, you don't sew, say, 10 centimeters of rope to 10 centimeters of canvas. There should be more canvas per length of rope, and the reason um, well, first you start with compatible materials. So if these are natural fibers, they should have a compatible elasticity. And same thing if they're synthetic fibers, they should have a compatible elasticity. And the idea is that when the sail is under tension, when you're pulling on it, the bolt rope comes up tight and limits the stretch before the canvas is strained too much. So the bolt rope is the limiting factor in the stretch. And it also can affect the shape. So similar to broad seaming, you can do some shaping with the rope and that is in how much gain or how much extra you sew in. So the way you do it is when you're sewing the rope, you curve it. So because the canvas is making the long outside curve, there's more of it than there was rope. So if you make a, a, a smooth gradual curve, that's not too much gain. You're not adding too much extra sail. And if you have a really hard tight curve, you're adding a lot of extra sail per rope. So you can do that differently as you go around the sail, depending on where you want it to really pull tight and where it can be a little more relaxed. There are questions so far. We're quiet about sails. Okay. Um, so the roping goes all, all the way around. Usually that's one person will do that so that they have the same sense of what's happening around the sail. The seaming people can switch off on, just it just has to happen. Um, with the roping, usually one, one person will go around and do the whole thing. And then you have the corners. These are always, always fun. So this happens to be the tack, so the tack uh, spliced in here. But you will need to add a way to attach the sail right at all of the corners. So there's different ways to do this, um, various kinds of cringles. Uh, this is a nice way. So the roping comes around the sail and is one piece, it's in here, it's covered in leather, and then this cringle is attached. Oh, I'm gonna take a moment for a question I see. Um, is there any roach in terms of shape applied to square sails? A very little bit on the head, a very little bit, um, but, but not much. Good question there. Um, okay. Is all this knowledge several hundred years old and the only, and only the materials have changed or have the sail making techniques changed? Uh, sail making techniques have changed a lot. Um, with changing materials. The one I'm talking about is old. <laughs> so, so this is a traditional, traditional sail making. 
uh, design and construction that is very, very old. Um, this particular process hasn't changed. Well, I mean, when do you want to start counting? <laughs> um, in the last, say, few, mm, 200 years, this is kind of, um, this sort of sail making has been happening like this. Lots of other kinds of sail making are happening. Um, some aren't even, some there's no stitching, things are just glued together. Um, and obviously there's all kinds of new things happening with hard sails, you know, hard airfoils that have lots of different adjustable pieces. Um, but, th but this process I'm explaining is, is one that hasn't changed much recently. Okay, is there any difference between how squares function as airfoils versus fore and aft sails? Yes, although maybe not as much as you would think. Is that reflected in the way the sail is cut? Okay, so I drew the shape of a, a fore and aft sail and how we added, um, I'll, oh yeah, we have time, I'll draw, I'll draw a little. <laughs> One moment. So the, the question is how, how the 3D shape of, of square sails comes into play and, and is that like four and a half sails or not in it? That the four and a half sails definitely have more of the airfoil cut into them because the square sails, although they can be used as airfoils, um, do that a little bit more in the way that they are set. Almost there, almost there. I don't have any more whiteboards. Okay, so. So fore and aft sail. Uh, um, about a, a third of the way in is where we put, we want the most curve. So that's how we cut the sail. To have that shape there, which then becomes our three dimensional shape. Uh, square sails, yes, they can, they work as airfoils, not when you're going, um, but they do, and, okay, let's draw, looking down. So looking down on this sail, while still being in the screen. Um, you see this kind of shape. Okay, so a square sail, we're on the wind, as much upwind as we can get. Um, draw this in a comparable fashion. So let's say here's the yard, we're looking down. Um, you, you spin the yard <laughs> so that the sail kind of makes the same shape. Because it's gonna switch sides, so if the wind is here, you want this is, you want the airfoil to be on one side, right? Curvy in the front and smooth here. But if the wind was the other way around, you want it to be the other way. If this is the wind, again, we're looking down and here's the yard, then you want the airfoil to be over here. Can you see that? So no, you don't cut an airfoil into the sail because you get that more from the way that you set it, the angle of the yards and the sheets being tight and appropriate. Um, the square sail, because I think you're gonna keep asking. So this, this curve has to be here. It's a practical curve. It has to get out of the way of something. There's a stay here. 
So this curve is not for shape. So um, in terms of shaping this sail, there's just a very little bit of roach on the head. Probably nothing on the leech. And again, this, this curve is for practicality. Does that answer the question? I'll give you a moment to, re to respond if that was if that was a question or not. Okay. So where were we? We're in the handwork. We're finishing up the sail. We've done the roping. Someone has done the roping. We have this Kringle. Here, this is the big corner. Um, so this has grommets, some small rings cut in it because we had to attach this piece of rope, which is wo woven back and forth and back and forth on itself. Um, and the way that you make these is similar um, to how you would do the rest of the Kringles. This sail has obviously not, not sewn grommets, not worked ones. This piece is made out of two halves. There's sort of a, a mushroom half and then a cap that you uh, punch a hole, put it through, and then pound it flat with a special backing iron. And you can also make these by hand. Here's some tiny ones that have been sewn. So these are, are sewn. Uh, there's, a, there's different methods to do these. Um, multiple methods do work, but don't hybridize the methods. That's my comments about that. Uh, here's another. This is a worked grommet. So this one was sewn and also had a liner hammered into it. Uh, just so there's less chafe and this will live longer than without it. Okay. Well, I figured we'd take more time for questions, so I already started a grommet here as a demonstration. So the last phase, let's say we're going to make a grommet. And this is made out of small stuff, which is normally left-hand laid, unlike our ropes, which are right-hand laid. But this, this delay goes up and to the left. And you're going to wax it again. Oh, question. Hold on. Uh, do different sail fabrics stretch when cold or wet? And do you have to design according for that? Um, Temperature is not so much, but humidity, absolutely. So cotton canvas, um, when it is wet, distinctly shrinks. Um, and then when it dries out, it goes kind of relaxes again again not not as badly as, as flax but that's that's quite old um but with the modern ones no they still they'll still freeze <laughs> but they they don't the fibers don't really absorb water so so this oceanus for example or or dirt on which this older sail is um, people don't use that so much anymore those don't absorb moisture so they don't really change their dimensions but they can they can sort of become frozen. So when there's water kind of in and around it enough, they can become frozen. So it's sort of like furling a, a refrigerator box when you're up there. So no, it's not absorbing the water, but it doesn't exactly, exactly feel like it's repelling it. Um, so yeah, wet mess in, in um, not, sorry, I'm trying to form a sentence here. You don't have to design for temperatures differences. Um, and yes, in cotton sales, so natural fiber sales, you'd, you'd think some about how they're gonna shrink. Mostly that means you just don't want lots of layers uh, because then the water gets in there and stays and then it behaves differently than the parts that have dried out. So you don't want piles of, you don't want too many layers of a, of a natural fiber material because when it gets all wet, those are gonna shrink and move differently than the other stuff that is dried out around it and can, can unevenly strain the sail. 
But with modern stuff, no, you don't worry about it. What can you do with the adventurous's main shape? Do you mean what to do about the current main sail? And the quick answer to that is I have not seen the current main sail set. So the quick answer is I don't know. Um, if the shape, yes, okay. I, I haven't seen it, this current sail. Uh, last year we set the, we a trisail. Um, we called the pilot sail because uh, we weren't gonna have enough people to set the main. So it wasn't bent on. Really once a sail is made, that's kind of the shape that it has. There's a few things you can do to tweak things. Um, one is if, if there's too much slack somewhere, you can add little darts. So sort of, I guess do with your shirt again. You can fold, fold over a little, a little bit. Can you see this? So you could fold over a little bit if you need to take up the sail and just sew that down. So there's a dart, that's an option if something is too loose. The next step is to redo the roping. And that again can help affect the shape. So that's something you could try. But if something is too tight, it's just maybe not a great design. Um, again, I haven't seen the current sale. I don't know what you're referring to specifically, but, but you can add darts and you can try to adjust the roping. But after that, it's kind of what it is. So I'll be curious to think about that when I actually do see it uh, set. Okay. I like this. Questions about, about sail shapes. We'll talk more about that next time. <laughs> so let's say here we're making a grommet. Um, and I've started. Again, so what we did was take the small stuff and ooh, um, weave it in a circle. And I, I did start because these usually take about 20 minutes to finish. So you didn't need to watch all of that. So you weave it around itself. Um, this is left hand lay. So when you go right over left, making this circle, it becomes right hand laid. Grommet, the grommet itself is right hand laid. And then you're gonna sew it in a circle. It does help to draw the outline of where you're gonna sew unless you, you're doing a lot of these. So it does help for starters to draw um, the circle and same thing I'll sit so that you can see as if you are doing this um, This time notice I'm not sewing with doubled thread. I have quadrupled thread and the reason for that is a few things one um, I don't need to take so many Stitches and I don't you definitely don't want to poke uh, holes close together when you're doing this so one of the one of the ways these go wrong or when people put the needle in right close to the grommet. Can you see that? Um, what you, you need to distribute the strain. So you're when you do these stitches, you're reaching away from the grommet. Try and show like this. The angle the needle is angling out, it's definitely not pushing in close. And same thing with this one. I didn't start with a knot, not many knots in sail making just here are the tails and you just start sewing and sew over the tails. The first stitch went in the same hole twice, like a lot of things to kind of anchor it in place. So I'll keep going around. Now I'll tuck those back away. Um, same thing, my, I'm checking with these fingers that my needles actually in the stone and spreading out the stitches and angling away from the grommet. Kind of feels funny because you never sew grommets into one layer of canvas, but here you are. And come up in the middle. And every stitch, I'm going to use my FID. So Sailmaker's tool of FID um, to kind of ream this out a little more and try and make it hard um, and stiff and round. So. Grommets always look bad when you start. You think it'll be the worst grommet you've ever done. And by the time you get three quarters of the way around, it starts to starts to shape up. So 
I'm going to carry on like this. And notice how I'm not trying to cover um, the grommet with the twine. That's not the point. It should line up in the inside. So they should all, it should kind of be full of thread on the inside, but the outside is not. Those, those stitches are spread out away from each other. Notice I haven't cut the tails of this yet because I'm still um, kind of reaming it out with my spike. You want to make sure that these tails don't disappear. Just one overhand knot is fine to finish it until I'm, I'm kind of coming upon them, then we'll cut them off, which I sort of am now. Okay. So now that I'm right on top of where that uh, end strand was, I can cut it off. Woo. And I do like to kind of open the threads on the inside, just for looks really. Bring this back up again. Oh, not the knife. <laughs> Again, so every one of these, you're using your fid to spread that grommet nice and tight. So on the back side, it looks kind of like this. If you had a hole punch, you could punch the hole for the grommet in the canvas. And if not, you don't need that. You can just cut um, an X with your knife and sew over the flaps, or you can cut a little diamond with your knife. Whatever you do, you're not going to need scissors. It's not a sailmaker's tool. So my grommet is going off to the side, which is fine in the beginning. That's where I said you think it's going to be the worst grommet you've ever done. And they seem to shape up the end. Okay, more questions as I'm going around in a circle here. I don't see any. So you can see the handwork portion takes uh, a while. Again, these, these things almost always take 20 minutes. Um, so it, it's a fair amount of time in the sail making process, traditional sail making process to, to add all of the final touches. I think you get the point with this. Oh, here's a question. On the jib tack, there was stitching between the grommets. Where does that come in? Good question. Okay. So what's happening here, um, the question is, Anne has noticed this uh, lashing here in between the two grommets. It's more like a lashing like that. So in the corners, you always end up having to poke holes in the sail to attach things to. So in this case, um, this is a good way to make a kringle. The bolt rope goes in here, and then we add the kringle on the outside, but it had to go through the sail. But when you poke holes in the sail, obviously it's not as strong, so you just made holes in it. So this is to reinforce um, the sail that now has holes in it. Also, when this is pulled on, this piece here, this ring is gonna you know, be pulled this way. 
And this ring here is going to be pulled this way. So this kind of completes the circle, this lashing here, and holds everything together. So they're always, they're always lashed together to reinforce and kind of make up for there being a hole. The same thing happened in this sail. It's maybe easier to see on this side. So same thing here. Um, there are holes poked in the sail and then they're reinforced with lashing. Okay. Well, we're coming up on an hour. Um, hopefully that at least got you some interest, some curiosity in sales and how you create a shape out of cloth. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, the next Doc Talk, I believe it will be about our haul out. And again, upcoming, we have Jim Lynch, Lynch an uh, author from the Northwest. And we're excited that everyone took some time this morning to join us. So any, any last questions? And then we'll sign off. Nothing immediately. Okay. Well, thank you everyone very much. And again, you can look at these anytime later and sign up for our notifications. And we'll see you next time. Bye.